So, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Howard Epstein, and our cast this evening, in order of appearance, will be Hilary Raymond as Chaim Weizmann, Anita Leaf as Theodore Herzl, Susan Olsborough as Arthur Balfour, Sharon Feingold as Harry Truman. She's got a much better American accent than I was ever able to produce. And Faye Bloom as David Ben-Gurion, who's achieved the look that I think Ben-Gurion was always, always after. Uh, on a serious note for a moment, this play reading was last performed in July 2018, when the part of Chaim Weizmann was played by Anthony Felix, well known to many of you as an eloquent speaker and a well-beloved member of the community in Netanya. Anthony tragically died at the weekend, so we dedicate this performance to his memory. On a happier note, and I hope Jeffrey Glask is here, because um, I've known Jeffrey, he's my oldest friend. We met at the age of two, 70 odd years ago, when his mum Leah was in her thirties. Yesterday, she celebrated her 103rd birthday. So we wish her a very, very hearty mazel tov. Welcome. All our cast are members of the most welcoming community in Israel, Young Israel of Ramat Poleg, who have given me an intellectual home this past year. And a wonderful year it has been, despite you know what. I'd also like to pay tribute to uh, two communities in Manchester, Yeshur and Shul and Bowden Shul, who have also given me a marvellous intellectual home this past year. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously something of a, of a <coughs> professional carpetbagger or cuckoo. Anyway, down to business. Um, in celebration of uh, Israel's upcoming 75th birthday in two years' time, and in the spirit of Purim, we welcome you to the Weizmann Dialogues and the opportunity to reflect on how the miracle of Israel's birth was achieved. In large part, it came about by the tireless dedication, not to say the genius, of one man, Chaim Weizmann. Born in the backwoods of a pale of settlement, he became the brilliant scientist who saved Britain and the empire from defeat in World War I, the leader of the Zionist movement for nearly half a century, a renowned international statesman, and the first president of the State of Israel. We shall offer you this evening a glimpse of the man that was Chaim Weizmann through imagined conversations based on true events between Weizmann and four personalities who played important roles in his quest to establish a Jewish home in what was then called Southern Syria, before it was called Palestine, a backwater for nearly 400 years of the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody is muted. Now, what would it have been like if Weizmann had had more than a brief meeting with Theodore Herzl in 1901. This is our interpretation of what these two great men may have said to each other were they to have met again in the afterlife. In the second act, we will suggest to you the sort of conversation Chaim Weizmann and Arthur Balfour might have had in the evening following the inauguration of the Hebrew University on the 1st of April, 1925. It was Balfour, you will recall, who was British Foreign Minister had addressed to Lord Rothschild the letter dated 2nd November 1917, a day that will live in great fame for the Jewish people that became known as the Balfour Declaration. That letter was brought out of the cabinet office by Sir Mark Sykes, the signature so wet that you, if you look at a facsimile of it, it is smudged, and thereupon handed it to Chaim Weizmann. Again, in Act 3, what if as spirits brought together for a short time, Weizmann had met Harry Truman in the afterlife to reminisce about their two seminal meetings in 1947 and 1948. And finally, we imagine what might have been said between Weizmann and his arch rival, David Ben-Gurion, when they met in early 1949, after Weizmann had last arrived in Israel from America. In this first scene, 
the spirit of Weizmann encounters that of Theodor Herzl in Gan Aden. And you'll have to unmute yourself, Anita and Hillary. Ah, President Weizmann, we have waited so long to have this conversation. How long has it been since we last met? Hey, many years. When you died so very young, I immediately felt a heavy mantle descend upon my shoulders, and I carried it for half a century. Yet it is you whom they all remember. Well, I don't wish to blow my own shofar, but I did revive Zionism when it was geschlafen. It's true, Theodore. Or may I call you by your name given at birth, Benjamin the Ev? I appreciate that your constant focus on Zion and Hebrew would drive you to say that, but Herzl will do. And how should I address you? My favorite appellation was that which Mayor Weisskohl and Abba Eben called me, Chief. So please tell me, Chief, what unfinished business do we have? Several issues. At first, I was impressed when you, we met with the world leaders, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople and the German Kaiser Wilhelm II in Eretz Yisrael. And of course, in London in July 1903, just after Kishnev. The first pogrom was the 20th century. Just so. Israel Zangwell introduced you to Joseph Chamberlain. What was he then? The British colonial secretary. Right. And he offered you, as a Jewish homeland, Uganda? In any event, in those days, quite apart from the fact that the Had Ha'am disapproved of your top-down strategy, I could not see myself in such elevated company. Then, when I hurried to London the following October, barely speaking a word of English, to repair any damage that Zangwell may might have caused, doing uh, might have oh, might be doing with the British politicians. Suddenly, I found myself at those dizzy heights. I was surprised that I was able to negotiate with them, but then I realized that I had been emboldened by your example. You are too kind. It's true that I got there before you, and I instructed a firm of British lawyers to draw up a proposal for a Jewish homeland in Uganda. Who were they now? Ach, yeah, Lloyd George Roberts and Co. Solicitors. David Lloyd George. Indeed, he was to become a great ally of ours, although notwithstanding taking into account the interest of the British Empire, of course, in any event, to get back to Uganda, what was on offer was really in Kenya, but should have been equally unacceptable. The so-called anti-room to Zion, yet you were prepared to entertain it as a possibility. You needn't have worried. Although I did not live long enough to see it, the special commission of inquiry that we sent to East Africa reported back to the Seventh Zionist Congress in 1905 that the land in East Africa was completely unsuitable for us. And after that, the idea was as dead as I was. Yes, yes, tragically dead, aged merely 44. You know, you died in 1904, just as I was leaving Geneva for Manchester. The timing is ironic, because one might say that that was where Israel was conceived. Manchester? Because that is where you developed synthetic acetone? Yes, an essential ingredient of cordite, 
the explosive favored by the British, but that's not the only reason. In Manchester, I had a power base of focused Zionists, the so-called Manchester School. Virtually no assimilationists, certainly no lovers of the Uganda proposal. And I found amazing allies in Harry Sacker, a genius who was the lawyer in Rotenburg in Eretz Yisrael. Who brought electricity to the Holy Land. Just so. But more importantly, Sacker was the political columnist of C.P. Scott's Manchester Guardian. Scott and his newspaper were a magnet for the Protestant Zionists who followed what was then a great British tradition of wanting to see the Jews return to their ancient land. Yeah, I caught up with my reading on that up here in Galaten. Your timing was perfect. I was extremely lucky. I was put in the right place by the same divine guiding hand that placed you in Paris in time to see the Dreyfus trial reach its excruciating conclusion in 1895. Ah, oh, poor Alfred Dreyfus, the scapegoat for the French obsession with the Germans, fomented by their virulent anti-Semitism. Insignia ripped from his uniform, sword broken in two, the crowd baying for Jewish blood. Abali Juif, death to the Jews! Is it any wonder that it was the Dreyfus trial that made me a Zionist? And Baruch Hashem that it did. But here is something I have wanted to ask, to put to you, and could not until now. I thought you were quite misguided over Uganda. If you will forgive me for raising that again, had you not died so young, had you lived this 120? Given that you would, as we you acknowledge, have had to have given up on Uganda, what else would you have been prepared to consider? Madagascar? Please, please will you not assume that had I lived on, I too would have accepted that Zion was, as you always claimed, the only proper place for our Jewish homeland? Let me put something to you. Had I not written Der Judenstadt, what would have been? I'd like to think that I would have seen that such a pamphlet was required. I did plenty of writing in student journals. I wrote the prefix to Zionism and the Jewish future and... And if I accept that you may well have written and published a Der Judenstadt, can you not grant that I would have seen that Zion was the only proper place for our Jewish homeland? Yes, Herzl. I think we are both right. But there was a further problem with your Jewish worldview. And that was? You were always looking for some document or title deed. You infuriated Achad Ha'am with that. Which implies that you too were infuriated because Achat Ha'am was your master and mentor. For 20 years in Motol and Pinsk and Berlin, I was his disciple. But after that, when we were both in England, we were not merely equals, peers, but indeed close friends. I wish it could have been that, that way for you too. But you and he were like oil and water. I confess to being unconvinced by your approach. I believed in practical Zionism and you in political Zionism. And you wish to remind me that the practicals and the politicals were always at loggerheads until you got them to work in parallel with your solution of synthetic Zionism by which you melded the two together. Like the synthetic rubber I was seeking in my laboratory at Manchester University that led to industrial scale acetone. Thank you. Not so fast, Chief. Uh, what's that? Who was it who in the end did secure a seminal document? Not I. Ah, 
I see. You were referring to Balfour's letter. Just so. I was right in principle, and you finessed my approach with the Balfour Declaration. I never saw it that way, and I'm flattered that you do. So you and I were two sides of the same coin. It was you who fired up the Jews of the East and the West alike. I never forgot the bombshell of your pamphlet, the Judenstadt, in the, my last year in Berlin in 1896. You, who had no background in, no knowledge of the Zionism that preceded you, you set the Jewish world alight with your brilliance. You laid out a blueprint for us. We, who had talked the talk, but had no concept of how to start the journey. And then, in 1897, you, a writer and a journalist, you convened the first Zionist Congress with 200 delegates, and the next year, at the second, with 400. And the term Zionism had been coined only a few years earlier. By Nathan Birnbaum in 1890, as I learned later. At the time, I had no idea where it came from. But then I'd never heard of Ben Yehuda or any of the other Zionists who had preceded me either. But the Congresses, yeah, they were indeed my crowning achievement. Had I known at my last, the six in 1903, say that they would continue throughout the 20th century and beyond, I should have been extremely proud. Also, I did make one fairly accurate prediction. Which was? I confided to my diary at the time of the very first Congress in 1897. I wrote, at Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. In five years, perhaps and certainly in 50 years, everyone will perceive it. I was amazingly close. In fact, I was over-optimistic by just a matter of months. I remember Herr Dr. Weizmann, the first time we met face to face, you came to confront me. On behalf of my democratic faction, the title seems so pompous now, over the approach to culture in the Zionist organization. But I was terrified of you that you might humiliate me. In those days, the age difference of what? A mere 14 years between us was a massive gulf. But you disarmed me. You were charming and solicitous. I could see no point in confrontation and was determined to put you at your ease. And you did. I was, I admit, charmed. And three years later, you were gone. Your premature death gave me my opportunity for leadership. Not that I would have wanted it that way. I wonder how much more quickly we might together have brought our people to Mount Zion before there was any need for a Mount Herzog. The world and history will never know. But I think we made a most effective team. I agree. Rather like a relay race team, you passed me the baton, your baton, and I ran with it. No, no, it was not like that. More accurately, I stood on a giant's shoulders. As did Ben Gurion and those others who followed you. In May 1918, Chaim Weizmann, realizing that the Arabs in Palestine were greatly disturbed about the burgeoning Zionist enterprise unfolding before their eyes, decided to try to build bridges with the most obvious future Arab leader, whom he identified as Emir Faisal, one of the leaders of the Arab revolt against the Turks. Faisal had fought through the Arabian deserts and the wastes up to Aqaba, en route to Damascus. He expected to be crowned King of Syria, 
Palestine was to him as it had been to the Turks, nothing other than the Sir southern Syrian province of the Ottoman Empire. Faisal was encamped with T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, in the desert close to the Red Rose city of Petra. Today we can fly from Tel Aviv to the Gulf of Aqaba in less than an hour. For Weizmann, the journey there from Yafo, there was no Tel Aviv in 1918, was an arduous one of a week by land and sea. They met for a few hours only, but they soon agreed that peaceful coexistence was what they wanted for their two peoples in Palestine. <clears throat> in January 1919, they signed a peace agreement in London, the faisal weizmann Treaty, the first between Arab and Jew. The next would be with Sadat. But Faisal added a rider to the effect that should he be deprived of his monarchy in Damascus, all bets were off. At the Paris Peace Conference that month, Faisal's man, Shekri Ghanem, declared that the Jews would be welcomed into Palestine and that if they were to form the majority there, they would be autonomous, as it was not to be. The French ejected Faisal from Damascus and Weizmann never found another Arab who had the same attitude. Things deteriorated with pogroms and other attacks on the Jews throughout the years of the British mandate. The first of them was in Jerusalem in 1920, but that city was soon to be, for Weizmann, the scene of a pivotal event with his most favoured project coming to fruition. Imagine, therefore, if you will, the place, Jerusalem. The date, 1st April 1925. Chaim Weizmann and Lord Arthur Balfour are together, firm friends now, the difficult years behind them. A momentous day for them both. You know, Arthur, your speech today to, on Mount Scopus gave me more pleasure than anything in my life so far. Lord Balfour needs to unmute. Susan, you need to unmute. Ah, perfect. Your words mean a great deal to me, Kayam. We have both come a long way since we met on that night in Manchester before my electoral disaster back in January 1906. It's not at every general election that the prime minister loses not only the election, but also his own parliamentary seat. To think that was almost 20 years ago. I asked you why you were so fixated on Jerusalem and you were unkind enough to tell me that when the Jews last lived here in Jerusalem, London was a swamp. I remember, but I was hoping you had forgotten the impetuousness of youth. How embarrassed I am to think that that's how I spoke to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Well, had we met a day later, you would have had less reason to be inhibited in any event. You got your point across. And now here I am in the ancient capital of the Jews. I have formally opened the first university in the Holy Land, for which you laid the foundation stones with Allenby in 1918, while the war raged over there. I have to ask you, how do you manage to be in the right place at the right time and with the right answers? If I were religious, I might re reply that I was guided by our Lord. But that would be to suggest that the deity is a Jewish God. While you, no doubt, would prefer to think of him as a Christian. But your synthetic acetone, which solved the shell crisis of 1915, arguably saved the Christian world. So I would, I do thank your God, without laying claim to him as the God of the Christians, that you have the solution to our problems. I had been seeking a way to make synthetic rubber. You know, Perkins, my professor told me to pour the whole thing down the... What thing? My soup. Soup? You were a chef in Manchester? In a way, yes. 
my soup fermented from the bacteria to be found on the humble corn of the cob. Maize contained butyl about which most people know nothing. Alcohol about which most people think they know a lot. And acetone about the significance of which even I had no idea at the time. And most importantly, I was able to separate them. Maize. I'm amazed. I thought you used conkers. Conkers? That's cornier than the corn. Let me go on. Then the price of rubber dropped, and I moved on to other things until the second year of the Great War, when I learned of the shell crisis. Don't I know it? Without acetone, which had formerly come from Germany with whom we were at war, we could not produce cordite, and thus the ammunition for our great battleships and our vast army in northern France. The government fell. A coalition government was formed. Later, Lloyd George, another great Zionist sympathizer, as you know, became the prime minister, and I became the foreign minister. And I was wheeled in to see Churchill, yet another Protestant Zionist, whom I had met in Manchester even before I met you. Funny thing is, on my first train journey from London to Manchester, I could not understand why all the stations were called Bovril. Oh. <laughs> Did Churchill remember you? He could hardly forget me, as he had asked me to address his constituents in Cheatham Hill. And I did, although he didn't have a clue about what I said. Why ever not? I spoke in Yiddish. What did you say? I said, by mir bist du schein, by mir hast du hein, by mir bist du eine auf der Geld. By mir bist du shame, by mir hast du hein, by mir bist du tear von Geld. Which means? I couldn't possibly say. If I told you, it would be the end of our great friendship. In any event, Churchill was by that time of our second meeting, 10 years later, first Lord of the Admiralty. And he asked me if I could industrialize my soup in order to produce large quantities of acetone. And after he gave me access to the Nicholson gin factory, I found that I could. Well, I make no bones about it. You averted a rout. We needed millions of shells a year and you made it happen. As Lloyd George wrote in his autobiography, you saved us from the defeat, and we gave you a homeland for the Jewish people. And we both know how wide of the mark is that glib little story. Yes, true. It took a major effort by all our people, yours and mine, and in the teeth of the opposition of Edwin Montague, the only other Jew besides Herbert Samuel at the center of events. Yes, yes. Dear old Edwin, so concerned for his comfortable life in London, but not a thought for his co-religionists suffering in Eastern Europe. Yes, yes. Edwin was never quite sure whether he was a Jewish Englishman. Or an English Jew. But where were we? Your tenacity. You refuse to let a little matter like Edwin Montague stand in your way. I should hope not. In any event, that would have been to let you down. For when Rothschild and I came to see you in June 1917, you told us that you still supported our project. And then you began submitting drafts of the letter for the cabinet. And cable after cable to the Americans. You then missed another essential cabinet meeting when the prime minister was again always, also away, giving Montague his second opportunity to convince the others that the Jews merely share a religion and do not constitute a nation. 
and you, my dear friend, you were nowhere to be found when the Imperial War Cabinet wished to invite you, uniquely as neither a politician nor a civil servant, into its deliberations. It was Lord George's idea. Mm, the Welsh wizard. The Welsh goat, more like. Because of his relationship with his secretary, Francis Stevenson? There was hardly a relationship that he did not have with dear Francis, eldest daughter's best friend, youngest daughter's governess, personal secretary, confidant and mistress, only the second in history to live at 10 Downing Street. It's a wonder he had any time and energy left to pursue the agenda of the Zionist Federation. Yet, as I say, it was he who thought to invite you into the cabinet meeting, and there you were gone. Please don't remind me. The 4th of October, 1917, and I was but three doors away down the corridor with Orms Bigot. You know, he came out here on the Zionist Commission with me in 1918. He introduced me to Wyndham Deeds. And it was Deeds who introduced me to the protocols of the elders of Zion. It was in Allenby's headquarters at Ramla. I had just arrived and could not understand the hostility from the general staff officers. Then he let me read what the British officers were reading, the protocols, that disgusting pack of lies about the Jews. They hate us when we are perceived as weak and they can launch pogroms at us, and they hate us when we are allegedly controlling the world. Well, now you have the chance to put all that behind you. Slowly but surely, you will get your opportunity here. From Jerusalem, the message will go out that the Jews are no longer confined to ghettos, but able to aspire at last to their divine mission, to be a light unto the nations, from here, the golden city of Jerusalem. You were captivated by the sunset this evening. I could see. How else could I be? The sun sets at the coast and the white stone architecture of this city becomes bathed in a wondrous golden light. Indisputably, had I seen that before we met, I should not have asked you in 1906 why you were obsessed with Jerusalem. Yet, and the history, of course. Did not Richard the Lionheart lead a crusade here to free Jerusalem for the Christians? That was almost 1,000 years ago. There has never been a city in history with the consequence, the iconography, and the allure of Jerusalem. Constantinople, Damascus, Baghdad, and Alexander, all are contenders, but Jerusalem stands alone. I regret, my dear Chaim, that your battles for Jerusalem may not yet be over, indeed may just be beginning. I'm sure you are right, and my profound regret is that Britain now finds herself presiding over two warring communities here, the Jews and the Arabs. As it is my regret that all the Christian Zionists have gone from the scene in Britain. Asquith, Lloyd George, gone. Long made way for a younger generation of politicians who care not a jot for Zionism and a Jewish home here. Mark Sipes, gone, the victim of the Spanish influenza pandemic. These losses make your task incalculably harder. Ah, poor Sykes. Was there ever a more complex man in whom resided an unlikely yet unwavering devotion to our cause and the Catholic to boot? Completely unfathomable. We had no greater servant than Sykes, although Ormsby Gore, Leo Amory, Ronnie Graham, and of course C.P. Scott also played essential parts. The civil servants and the politicians and the others who were sympathetic to Zionism 
and onto Palestine for the protection of the east flank of the Suez Canal, if I'm to be completely honest. They have all left the scene now, and I am no longer at the centre of events and shall not be again. They have kicked me upstairs to the House of Lords, where I can do them no harm. Only Churchill is still around. And after 1921, when he gave Transjordan three quarters of Palestine to the Hashemites, you have to regard him with a certain amount of circumspection. Arthur, my friend, I hate to argue with you, particularly when you are pleading my cause, but Churchill did us the biggest possible favor. How so? I fear we shall never have the manpower that would be needed to defend those frontiers. Thousands of miles bordering on Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Syria. No, 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 no. A poison chalice for us. I thank heaven Churchill spared us that. Mm. So, my friend, what about you? You will move your laboratory here to your university and continue your researches here? By and by I shall. As you know, I have been president of the Zionist organization these past four years, and I find that London is as good a base as any for my worldwide Zionist activities. My life has always run along the parallel tracks of Zionism and chemistry, and it is your chemistry with people that wins them over that is so important. I fear that it is less effective here in our issue and with its people than in the corridors of power in the West. I suppose it is not for nothing that the children of Israel were described by the Almighty as a stiff-necked people. Mm -hmm. Exodus 32.9, as I recall, all about divisions within? Just so. And we have them here already. And that, despite the difficulties we have with our Arab neighbors, thus, I feel that we were, if we were ever to resolve those problems, we could tear ourselves apart. And that is where what will be this great university will play its part. The students will enter here as little more than children. The scales will fall from their eyes. They will learn received truths and they will become unified. Even those who come from the most obscure places will from this academic melting pot emerge as adults with a common view of life and its problems from this, your university. Arthur. I think you are being somewhat optimistic. Youth today is male less malleable than it was when we were young. I am not so sanguine as you. I think it is entirely possible that we shall come to regard them as rebellious. Their attention span is so very short and they seem to need to see results more quickly than our generation. Perhaps you are right but you will have provided them with the environment in which they will have no excuse should they not be constructive. In any event, I must say this, all that you have done for us, Arthur, is a complete reward for me. I doubt that any other human being could do more, could give more from a Christian heart than you, my Lord Balfour. And my reward, not that I sought any, was your invitation to me to launch the university today, to see what you have brought about here in a mere seven years. Reminds me that Oxford and Cambridge were founded 700 years ago, were it not for the Romans who kicked your ancestors out of Jerusalem 2000 years ago, you and I would have been deprived of this glittering pedagogic day in the sun. 
your gracious acceptance of our invitation to declare the Hebrew University open will remain as a tangible and enduring reminder of the time when the British and the Zionists stood shoulder to shoulder in the most constructive of endeavors. Yes, the return of the people of the book to their biblical roots and their immediate founding of the world's most modern educational establishment is truly momentous. Doubly momentous, because by your intimate involvement, first by authorizing Allenby to allow me to set the 12 foundation stones, one for each of the tribes in Israel on Mount Scopus in 1918, and again, by your speech today, you have given the blessing of the British to my life's work, the fusion of Zionism and study. Forgive me, Arthur. I feel overcome by the significance and the symbolism of the moment. Howard, you're muted. Howard, you're muted. I'm mute, Howard. Sorry, folks, I'll start again. <laughs> the years that followed were fraught for the British and the Yishuv. The second, a second Arab revolt, this time against the British, caused the mandate authorities to make life harder for the Jews. Hitler came to power in 1933 and it was plain that the Jews were in urgent need of their homeland. At the Evian Conference, also in 1936, no one would take any of the doomed Jews of Europe, not even America. Also in 1936, Weizmann addressed the Peel Commission, declaring in the light of the growing Nazi menace that there were six million Jews in Europe for whom the world is divided into places where they cannot live and places where they cannot enter. Peel suggested partition of the land between the Yishuv and the Arabs, what you might call a two-state solution. The Arabs rejected it outright. Weizmann embraced the idea and bided his time. In April 1939, the notorious British white paper slammed the gates of Palestine shut on the Jews, and with the coming of war that September, they were entrapped in Europe. By the end of the war, Six million Jews and their Yiddish culture had been cruelly destroyed. Much of Britain had been destroyed too. Exhausted economically, and with 100,000 troops in Palestine unable to suppress Jewish activism, the British threw the hot coals of the problem into the lap of the United Nations. In November 1947, there was to be a United Nations vote on partition. Weizmann, no longer president of the Zionist organization, merely a private citizen, was urged to go to New York to assist in lobbying for support in the vote. Once there, Weizmann was shocked to hear that the State Department was proposing to remove from us the Negev, 55% of our land. He went to see the president, Harry Truman. In this next scene, we ask you to imagine the spirits of President Harry Truman and Chaim Weizmann reminiscing in the afterlife. They have much to discuss. Mr. President. I can now address you likewise, President Weizmann, and I am so pleased because as you know, I could never pronounce your name properly. Chaim, Chaim, Chaim. You see, I'm no more articulate now. I never gave it a moment's thought. I was overawed by the surroundings when we met. The famed Oval Office in the equally august White House. It was more impressive to me than the Admiralty in London where I saw Winston Churchill in 1915. In our simpler way, we Americans seek to honor our people with a certain amount of majesty without having to address anyone as 
your majesty. So the White House stands as a symbol to America's greatness. Yet five days a week, ordinary people form orderly lines and visit it. The British are not quite so open. I agree. Their captivity for clandestine conduct was clear to me when dealing with the Mark Sykes. You completely lost me there, Chime. Please explain. Here was the man who had just carved up the future Middle mm. East, on paper at least, with his French counterpart, Francois George Picot. Yet Sykes joined into our most sensitive meetings in the UK Zionist Federation throughout 1917 and gave nothing away to us about his treaty signed the year before. It was as though there were two of him, if you follow. It would have been espionage had he not been 100% for us. And do you know that Churchill had the US ambassador to England over to dinner on the evening before December 7, 1941, as the Japanese fleet was sailing towards Pearl Harbor? The British had broken the Japanese codes and the great man knew, but made no reference to the fact that those whom he dearly wished would join the war were about to lose their Pacific fleet. I was always accused by my compatriots in the Zionist movement of being in the pocket of the British. But in truth, I had no illusions about their ability to face two ways at once. The Balfour Declaration itself contained a typically British fudge. In any event, you did become the first president of the Israel that you created. That would have been stillborn, for it not for you, Mr. President. I achieved so much for you. I sent a cable, that's all. May I make so bold as to correct you? The United States Telegram of Recognition, the very first that we received, was just one. Actually, the third of the three major indispensable gifts that you gave us. Kindly remind me of the others. Do you remember? I was smuggled in through the east wing of the White House on two separate occasions? Ah, yes. <laughs> I do remember. You appear to have something in common with certain other visitors after your time, although they tended to be female and to be shown straight up to the Lincoln bedroom. Which was the first occasion you visited me? as U.S. President. The first time was just before the U.N. General Assembly vote on partition in November 1947. Ah, I remembered that Roosevelt, that colossus, whose boots I had to fill within four months of becoming Vice President, had invited you over to assist with the rubber crisis in 1942. We needed millions of tons of rubber a month and the traditional sources, the rubber trees, were trapped in Japanese controlled Malaya. My impact was not so great. Bernard Baruch and the giant US oil <laughs> industry found a way to make rubber from oil. Ah, but I heard from my predecessor Wallace that they had not fixed certain problems and that you solved them. So I was delighted to receive you, and I wanted to know how I could possibly help with partition. And you, if I may say so, with some, uh, what do you call it? Uh, chutzpah. Exactly, chutzpah. No, chutzpah. That's what I said, chutzpah. And you told me that you were pleased to find that I could read a map. I came to see you to ask you to correct the wrong that your State Department was perpetrating. They were trying to remove the negative 55% of our emerging state from our allocation of land. And I showed you the partition map. I told you that we needed a gateway to the east and immediately you understood it. 
I was a simple country boy from Missouri, grew up in the boondocks. So I had to know maps, didn't I? I suppose so. But when I really became expert with maps was in World War I. And do you know who learned with me? Eddie Jacobson? Correct. And he didn't have a clue when we started out together. But what he lacked in cartographic skills was more than compensated by his Jewish head for figures and for making money. Without him running the haberdasher store we set up together after the war, I could never have entered politics. We'll come to Jacobson by and by. First, I want to say that without the Negev, we would have had no chance of survival. We had no strategic depth in the Galilee with a large Arab population and the Syrians looking down on us from the Golan Heights. And there is surely none. There never was any in the center where we had until 1967 a tiny waste of eight miles at its narrowest point. The narrowest part of the USA is several thousand miles wide. And then you have the two great moats of the Atlantic and the Pacific. So the Negev was a prerequisite for our survival. You have no idea what pleasure I got from calling up those good old boys in the State Department at the UN, just as they were about to rob your people and telling them to put the Negev back in of which we have always been indebted to you. Oh, we shared something else, by the way. What's that? A revulsion of Ernest Bevan, the British Labour government's foreign minister. I am clear that he was an enemy of Zionist aspirations, but why did you dislike him? He accused me in 1946 of being carelessly pro-Zionist, alleging that in my calling for the admission of 100,000 Jews into Palestine, I was merely courting Jewish votes in New York. The election was not to be held for another two years. In any event, in his mind, the contest was between Palestine, where the Yeshuv was crying out for them, and the USA, which was demobilizing 16 million men and women from the armed services after the war. So you would certainly have been unable to digest another 100,000 Jewish immigrants? Bevin's view was highly subjective. Well, to be fair to Bevin, although I see no good reason to be given his unfairness both to you and to me, if 100,000 British troops could not keep the peace in Palestine, the Brits were unlikely to welcome a similar number of Jewish refugees. And they made it abundantly plain that they would not. But if you will forgive my saying so, after the UN vote in November 1947, when the world community voted to give us a state, and I went back to London, you cut yourself off from us. That was also a matter of survival. My, I was bombarded by every Jewish organization in America and most of the Jews, or felt that way. 10,000 letters and cables in December 47 alone. That was over the State Department wanting to undo the decision of the UN and impose a trusteeship over Palestine until the Jews and the Arabs sorted out their differences, or until hell freezes over, whichever is the earlier. We are still waiting. It seemed to us that the Jews out there were bound to be slaughtered, and we had no troops left to send to rescue them. We were still cleaning up what I had inflicted upon Japan. And we were busting our guts to keep Stalin out of Western Europe. Not so fanciful. In June 1948 came the Berlin airlift. Had that failed, who knows what would have followed? Well, 
You know what happened next. I was frail and my sight was failing, but my people persuaded me to return to the United States to see you again at the beginning of 1948. And I left you cool in your heels at the Waldorf Astoria. I'm sorry, Kayim. Truly, I could not cope. I could see no solution, and there were plenty of other matters pressing down on me. And that's when Eddie Jacobson re-entered your life. Ah, yes. He turns up on a March Saturday afternoon after I wrote to him saying that I was finished with the whole business. And he tells me, I have to see you. I'm sure he wasn't smuggled into the East Wing. I'm curious, how did he finally persuade you to see me? He noticed a small statue I had in my Oval Office of Andrew Jackson, the founder of my Democratic Party, riding on a horse. I'm surprised that a nice Jewish boy like that would know one end of a horse from another, let alone recognize a president riding one. Well, anyways, Jackson was my hero. And as Eddie told me, you were his hero. That's how Eddie found my Achilles heel. So again, you were smuggled in. So the State Department shouldn't know. Right. And you asked me to allow Jews to take their chances with the three to one supremacy of the Palestine Arabs and five invading Arab armies. I thought you were loco. I mean, really crazy. But you persuaded me that the alternative was certain annihilation. So I agreed and I made up my mind to push it through. Secretary of State George Marshall, the greatest living American notwithstanding. Well, you were famous for something else in your Oval Office, as I recall. The sign that said, the buck stops here. True. And George finally got that message. In the end, he graciously conceded that I was the president. So I was the one that got to make foreign policy. It is most gratifying that your cable, the first recognition of Israel, found favor throughout America. Except unsurprisingly in the State Department. But do you want to know what finally convinced me you were right? Do tell. As I saw it, with hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors stuck in displaced person camps in Germany and Austria, and in those constructed for them by the British in Cyprus, all of which they must have loathed, their end would have indeed been an inevitable, if slow, annihilation. And if you were prepared to risk everything for which you had worked in Palestine, at least they would have a fighting chance. Right, so. And one other factor. Which was? You. You who had been at the center of things for more than half a century, and whom I knew to be a brilliant scientist, used to experimentation and making calculations. If you chose that route, why should I allow a step to be taken to deprive your people of their once in a millennium opportunity? Actually, it was once in 2,000 years. And the Jewish people will always be grateful to you, Mr. President, for ensuring that partition would go ahead. Don't be so sure as to the gratitude. They need to be grateful to you, too. But sometimes the reputations of the real heroes get interred with their bones. And then while the body could be dug up in a day's digging, the reputation stays stubbornly underground. Fortunately, you and I do not work for garlands and reputations, but for justice, not injustice, for right as opposed to wrong. Just so, Chime. Since I got up here, I did a little research about you, and I found out that you registered 
233 patents arising from your scientific work in the 20th century alone, that the Weizmann process is considered to have accelerated the development of the penicillin that saved so many lives in World War II, and that the Weizmann, Weizmann process is still in development in the 21st century in the field of genetic engineering. And most importantly, you did have that knack of being in the right place at the right time with the right skills and the right people. I was either the luckiest man in history or the real he is a god. And he put me there three times, once with the British and later twice with you. Is there a god, do you think? We would like to think that up here we might know the answer to that. And perhaps eventually we shall. But I will tell you that the great Albert Einstein, who, as we know, studied the secrets of the universe, said to be an atheist would be presumptuous. And both you and I are far too modest to be presumptuous. Speaking as a farm boy from the backwoods of a remote state to a boy born in a simple wooden shack in the backwoods of Belarusia, I cannot disagree. In this, in this the last scene, the setting is Rehovot, in Weizmann's home known as the palace in early 1949. Weizmann is there with his nemesis, David Ben-Gurion. Israel's first prime minister had asked Weizmann not to arrive in Israel from New York until September 1948, almost six months after independence was declared. The atmosphere is tense. I think you owe me an apology. Oops, sorry. Oh, for what? For keeping me out of the way while you sorted out the jobs for the boys. That was not the reason. I did not want you here until the worst of the fighting was over. I was merely seeking to protect our president. You will have to do better than that. You will not be able to explain away so easily how I came to be the only leading Zionist who did not sign the Declaration of Independence. That was last May. You were luxuriating in the vault of Astoria Hotel in New York. That is complete stus, stirred. Not only was my home here since 1936, but also, as you well know, Truman demanded at our last meeting that I stay in the USA as his sole point of contact with the Jewish lobby until independence was declared. How come a space was not left for me to sign? Others signed after the 14th of May, 12 of them. They were in Yerushalayim, weren't they? And yes, the other two were where I was in New York. I don't know. I am the prime minister, not the office boy. I don't control every piece of stationery. Perhaps not. But I believe that you are in control of prosperity and reputations. Now, putting that on one side for a moment, tell me this, David. You still consider that the socialist model is the proper one, do you? You will do not want to embrace the full-throated capitalism that has made America the most powerful nation on earth? Do you think, Kayim, that we would have a state today without socialism? Let me answer that in my way, quietly and without hysterics or histrionics. Is that an oblique reference to the Biltmore Conference? that I convened in New York in 1942? You convened? 
Would you like me to call Mayor Weisgel over to challenge that? He is five minutes walk away. He made all the arrangements for the conference for me because I wanted to unite all the disparate American Zionist groups so that they would demand that the British establish in Palestine a Jewish commonwealth. As for you, not content with haranguing the Americans during the conference, you went on to browbeat them all over again with your screaming and shouting afterwards until they wearied of you. Plainly, you learned nothing from the Americans refusing to send you and Ben Zvi as their representatives on the Zionist Commission in 1918. Would that the Biltmore were the only example of your extravagant behavior. I got their attention, the Yanks, didn't I? And I didn't? Do you deny that it was I who united them all, the Zionist groups, under our umbrella? Do you consider that a greater contribution than the toil of our glorious workers up and down this land, in our kibbutzim, in our moshavim, in our factories, turning an idealistic vision of a country into a working one? Important, of course, but they did it diligently and quietly. So it's my style that you object to, rather than my politics. They are intrinsically bound up together. I am sorry to say, David, that your judgment is often questionable. Meaning? In World War I, you twice tried to raise an army for the Turks. Once here, and after they expelled you to Egypt, again in America, you went to four cities looking for Jewish conscripts for the Ottoman army. Until the thunderbolt of the Balfour Declaration. Then immediately I could see which way the wind was blowing. Is it so terrible to want to back the winning side? That's just what I mean about judgment. The Turks treated the Jews as dimmies, second-class citizens, and they despoiled Palestine, not merely for 350 years, but most especially in World War I. Most of the youth that you wanted to conscript to the Turkish cause were expelled, and what was left here to greet the Zionist Commission in 1918 was a woe-begone, impoverished community of the old, the sick and the dying. But for you, it was enough that Constantinople might prevail. It is as painful for me to say it as it will be for you to hear it. But you were a hothead in the 20s, and you are a hothead now. Oh, when did my behavior last offend you? How long is it since the Altalina and the killing of our Jewish boys by other Jewish boys under your orders? It was less than six months ago. Do you know something, David? You are very lucky in your adversaries. It was you who nearly undid all my work, and it was Menachem Begin who saved us from the civil war that could have been triggered by the Altalina, that would have been our undoing. That man's restraint came, on, came only from a fear of losing a battle with the magnificent socialist worker in arms in the Palmach. In any event, it is wrong to typify the Altalina as my unilateral action. I reported to the provisional government. There was a debate. Orders were given to Dan Evan, and he took it upon himself to write to Bergen, giving him time to give up the arms of the Igun. There can only be one army here. Bergen, the intransigent one, held out. Only then was the military order executed. I think history will recognize in Begin what you can never concede. Menachem is a man of the highest integrity. And I? I think they will say of you that you did what had to be done. I shall concede that. But I would have done it differently. 
I will grant you that a leader in these times and in this place cannot afford to be weak, too meek or too gentlemanly, but he should at least be measured. So you disapprove of our shooting down last week five Egyptian Spitfires over Sinai, even though they were being flown by pilots from the RAF? I expressly commend and applaud it. The Brits went too far in their support of the Egyptians on that occasion, and it's already proving to be the end of that monster, Ernst Bedin as a political force. Would that it could have come sooner. No, my complaint is a broader one. Which is? Your obsession with socialism has already cost us much. Oh, ridiculous. You will have to justify that statement. The British, for whom my affections called many years ago, made it abundantly clear that they will give independence to territories under their control, as they did in 1947 with India, the jewel in their crown, provided the incoming political masters are not communists. And I am a communist? David, look in that mirror over there and then look at me. To you, you do not seem a communist. And to me, you do not look like a communist. But to the British, you certainly seem closer to Moscow than to New York. Chaim, Chaim, Chaim. If you believe that that's why the British helped the Arabs and would gladly have sent you to hell, you will die more British than Israeli, however long you live which I hope will be a very long time. Oh, I am frail and almost blind. Let me get to the point. I do not have long now. I believe that I have been of some service to the creation of our Jewish state. Certainly, and I readily grant you that without the Balfour Declaration, your Balfour Declaration, and the magic you worked with Truman especially the first recognition of our state at 11 minutes past midnight on the 15th of May, we would not be where we are today. But as a practical Zionist from way back, willing to confront Herzl over it, will you not concede that it has been largely by the efforts of our workers that we arrived here? Yes, of course. I would not hesitate to praise the workers of the Yeshuv. But to get to my personal question, as you are now in charge, what will my, be my duties as president of the state of Israel? I do not expect to emulate an American president and become commander in chief of the IDF, but am I to be a mere functionary, just signing off the bills of the Knesset like the King of England? Let me give it to you straight, Chaim. For you, it is perfect. You will have risen to the very peak to which you aspired, signing off bills like the British monarch, like the royalty with whom you mingled. What better way for you to end your brilliant career, forged in England and inspired by it? Will you become the illustri illustrious scientist who brought his inspiration here, to the Hebrew University, which you founded, and to your scientific institute here in Rehovot, which I understand is about to be renamed in your honor to point the way for generations to come whose achievements neither of us dare imagine. Is that not enough? Do not press me to give you political powers as I shall never be persuaded. And you will spoil an evening of harmony that we have both enjoyed. Harmony. I should like to believe in your good faith towards me, David, and I shall never forget what you wrote to me in 1936. I meant every word of that letter. Einstein, your friend, suggested to you, I think somewhat mischievously, it must be difficult to be, cho to be the chosen one of the chosen people. But I wrote to you, 
that the Shekhinah of the Jewish people rests on you. Even as you bury my residual ambitions, you manage to schmooze me. I never knew you had such subtlety within you. You flatter me, Chaim, but I want to put something else to you, but very confidentially. In the privacy of these four walls, putting everything else aside as peace-loving as we both are, filled with the desire for shalom, surely we have to admit that there would not be a state of Israel without those brave boys, those saintly martyrs of the Agun and the Lechi, they who turned to dust the east wing of the King David Hotel, they who took an eye for an eye with the hanging of the two British sergeants in Italian in retribution for the murder by the British of three boys of the Agun. The British never dared do that again. And after the King David, they could not wait to get out of here. Bitter, but proudly real, David, like life itself. So in the end, that is indeed where we meet, in our secret understanding, whether in the home from which we both came on the blood-soaked soil of Europe, which you and I were spared, and on the battlefield that was Palestine and is now our Jewish homeland restored. Yes, Chaim. In the end, as Churchill said, it takes blood, toil, sweat, and tears. The blood of our fallen sons and daughters, the arduous toil of our indomitable workers, and the sweat of their brows, and our tears for all those who did not reach this day, never saw the Jews free and independent in their own, their ancient land. This is what unites us, you and me, the aristocrat statesman and the worker politician. We share more than can ever divide us. We were never going to let our squabbles spoil our joint achievements and theirs. But Chaim, let us hit a positive note. Look at how far we have come we worked the land until our hands bled, spade in one hand, gun in the other, as we made the desert bloom while dodging bullets. Yes, rather than sit idly and bemoan our fate, we changed our fate. We built institutions from orchestras to trade unions to political parties to health care. And we will gather in as many Jews from Arab lands as Arabs ran from here at the bidding of their nihilistic leaders. They brought the war to us and we shall end it stronger and with more territory than, they, than we would have had if they had left us alone. We talk peace and they shun it. We grab that partition and they walked away from a two-state solution. And I foresee that they will do so for another hundred years. They think they have time on their side. But we shall use our time to make this country worthy of the blueprint we delivered to the British government in February 1917, which read, democratic, rooted in the rule of law, a trusting ambition to develop infrastructure, industry, and agriculture, locally autonomous, supportive of institutions, existing and projected, and a right of citizenship for Jews from all over the world. As you and your people conceived it, Chaim, I and my people weaned and nurtured it. Absolutely. But I have a final question for you, David. On the 12th of May last, you contacted me in New York and said the Hevra in the provisional cabinet, 10 of them, including you, the chairman, were unsure whether or not to declare independence. I replied, what are they waiting for, the idiots? It's now or never. The vote was taken, and the result was six in favor and four against. So, 
My question is this, David. Had the vote ended in a draw, how would you have cast your chairman's vote? The truth is, Chaim, mm, I have often asked myself that question. But human beings are created to be loyal, not to their past. No. Human beings are created to be loyal to their future. Well, I want to thank my wonderful actors, which is what actresses call themselves these days, I've noticed. Fantastic performance. I also want to thank our sponsor, Techelet, and Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Lieberman. Jonathan, Johnny, please wow. say. Wow, that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Kolakavod to you, Howard, for having written that. And let me give you a big plug. Uh, that was all based on Howard's book, which you can see here. Uh, uh, it's called Israel at 70 uh, in Weitzman's image. Uh, it's brilliant, brilliantly written, and you should all get a copy and read it. Um, Howard, that was superbly written. And the four of you were just amazing. Was it four or five? I don't know. I, however many of you it were, you were all absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm speechless at how good that was. And, and I, by the comments that we've got on the chat, everybody's agreed with me. Uh, I, I'm very, very, very proud indeed to have uh, that performance associated with Techelet. Uh, many of you are familiar with Techelet, but I can see from the participants' lists that we have some people who may not be familiar with Techelet. So just allow me two minutes to tell you about what we're, we're trying to do. As you can see from the banner behind me, we're called Techelet, Inspiring Judaism. And what we're trying to do is to uh, get the uh, Torah to Israel, Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael to be front and center of people's lives, to inspire uh, a feeling of connection to uh, Judaism, to Israel and to the people of Israel, uh, with our various programs and this without a doubt has been inspirational and has been part and I'm very very pleased that Techelet is associated with that. Uh, there is on the uh, chat screen uh, I have put the our website uh, link and Avril has put our Facebook uh, link as well. Uh, before you sign off copy those over and have a look at what we've got to uh, offer on Techelet and hopefully you'll be inspired Thank you again, uh, Howard and Hillary and Faye and Susan and, uh, and who have I missed? Sarah, I need to, uh, Sarah, to um, say that there is a real connection here this evening. If you can see Johnny, where have you gone? Johnny Halpin's great grandfather was um, Joseph Massel, I think, who met Weizmann off the train from London when he arrived at London Road Station in Manchester, now called Piccadilly, uh, and speaking very few words of English. Uh, and so there's a direct connection from um, 1904 to today. So I don't know where you've gone, Johnny. Oh, there you are. So just give everyone a wave. That's right. Great. And I'd just like to say also that the, what I forgot from the, writing the book is the symmetry of Weizmann's life. You heard about how the Der Judenstadt was a bombshell for him. How the Balfour Declaration was a bombshell for Ben-Gurion. Uh, the confrontation between Herzl and Weizmann. Then there was a confrontation, which I didn't cover, between Weizmann and Ben-Gurion in uh, 1920 in uh, London. And then the two crises. I mean, how is it that the acetone is trapped in Germany in 1915 and the rubber is trapped in Malaya in the Second World War? Quite astonishing. He's a key, the key to the first, and a key to the uh, solution for the second. And there he is in the right place at the right time with the right answers and the chemistry, not only in his work, but in his character to reach out to other people. Uh, to me, it's quite an amazing uh, life journey. And when you think of all those people who signed the Declaration of Independence, there, and he didn't get to sign it, Ben Gorion made sure his reputation was buried deep. They're all tailors. They're experts at basting, binding, tapering, gauntlets, hems and 
gussets. They can do anything a tailor can do. The only thing is, the material hasn't arrived. Who's bringing the material? Chaim Weizmann. He went to collect it from Balfour. He had to run it by Truman. If he'd failed with either of them, had not got the Balfour Declaration, had not retrieved the Negev, or prevented the slide back to trusteeship, or failed to get the first recognition from the USA, no material. No material, no Israel. So there are a lot of essential characters, but the quintessential one is Chaim Weizmann. I don't know whether you, anyone wants to um, raise any questions, but you can all unmute yourselves and I'll be very happy if you've got some questions. I just want to th thank the uh, performers again. They were really phenomenal. They worked really, really hard. Uh, in a month, they produced this superb. Uh, and Anita, let's see you without your Purim um, get up. <laughs> Maybe I've embarrassed you now. She's very pretty. And, and, uh, <laughs> full, mark, full marks of all, all of you wonderful. I shouldn't single anybody out. Any questions? No? Uh, I just want to say that the acting was brilliant. The, the accents, the accents were great. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. It was very, very good, Howard, and brilliantly written. Philip, I'm going to, I'm going to write a play. Um, about Mrs. Um, Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir, and Mrs. Bandaranaika, and you can have all four parts. <laughs> <laughs> I would put on the accent very, very well. You know, I, 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 have, uh, uh, I have listened to many Indians and, and Sri Lankans and etc. and I can I imitate their accent very, very well. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you, Howard. Yes. Howard, Howard. how, how yes. comes, how comes until, uh, I thought I was quite well versed in history, but how comes Weizmann was, what he did was hidden, basically? How come Weizmann what, I'm sorry? How comes what he did was hidden? Hidden? Ben-Gurion buried his reputation. There's a whole chapter in my book about it, and I've uh, lectured on it occasionally. He wanted to be the only Zionist who would be remembered. And when I give talks, I often say, if you say to an Israeli kid who is Ben-Gurion, they'll say, oh, his first prime minister could stand on his head. Actually, Faye, you promised you'd stand on your head before the evening's out. We're going to keep you to it. But if you say to the Israeli kid, and Weizmann, <laughs> they'll say, go down there, turn right. That's Weizmann. OK. Rechov Weizmann, and that's the end of it. Don't open the door, guys, because I'm about to stand on my head. <laughs> I was kidding. I was kidding. All right. We're not in short. Any other questions? <laughs> no, Howard. Thank you all for attending. Oh, You've come a long way. Yes, I, I would like to thank you for giving us the opportunity. Um, as hard as it was, I didn't realize when I said yes what it encouraged. You had a huge task. <laughs> but yeah. huge I've got task. one thing to say to you. you did an amazing job. Religious. I would say there was a girl. Watch last because I'm standing on my head. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Johnny, we got, got four money now. Thank you very much. Johnny, I need to talk to you. Can I call you up uh, in a minute? Yeah. All right. Thank you, all my co, Thank co actors you. and Thank actresses. You so Thank very you nice. for the opportunity, Howard. It was wonderful. Yeah. Glad you enjoyed it. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Howard. It was amazing. Thank Hillary. you.